no one has a more enthusiastic gay man than when Amy does the uh, the announcements, right? And then she uh, prays, and it's uh, it's kids men right here, and all God's children said amen, and we shout it out. It's great. I love it. I love it. Good morning, and it's really nice to see you today. Uh, this past summer, I was at the um, the San Diego Safari Park, uh, and uh, they had part of the the celebration for the summers, they had these jugglers that were sort of roving throughout the park. And uh, they were they were really good, you know, tossing bowling pins in the air four at a time behind their back, bouncing off the ground, all these amazing kind of juggling techniques. And then there was this one guy that was there and he was teaching kids how anybody really, but even the littlest kids, he was teaching them how to juggle. And I'm thinking to myself, I got to watch this because seriously, you're going to teach a little kid how to juggle? Because I've tried juggling, and, and it, you know, it's not that easy. And so I'm thinking, you're going to be teaching little kids how to juggle. And, but then they, they gave the kid the ball, and then they said, I just want you to start with just one ball up and down. Just one at a time. And I'm going, wait, that counts? So now I consider myself a juggler. (laughs) But as it turns out, juggling is also a great metaphor for our spiritual lives. Here's what I mean. In our walk with God, it is so tempting to want to have our cake and eat it too. That is, as the title of this message indicates, we try to juggle Jesus and Jezebel. And the trick, it turns out, comes back to just juggling one of them. But now I'm getting ahead of myself. Open with me, if you will, to uh, Revelation 2.18. Today we continue our series, You Need to Hear This. Uh, We are looking at the seven letters in Revelation that the risen Jesus dictated to John to carry to his churches. These seven letters that are almost 2,000 years old, but they still address the same problems and issues that you and I face. And we still need to hear the promises that they hold. Every generation, it turns out, of believers have needed to hear the counsel, the warnings, the the comfort, and the advice that Jesus offers to his people in these letters. Turns out, you need to hear this. In each of these seven letters, every single one of them, Jesus speaks the same phrase. He says this, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So yes, these are ancient letters to churches long ago. But God made sure they endured, made sure that they made it into the end of our Bibles because they are still relevant to us today. This morning, we're going to look at Jesus' letter to Thyatira, uh, Revelation 2.18. Hopefully, you found it by now, Revelation 2.18, in your Bibles, on your phone, so you can track with me as we look at it together. And Revelation 2.18 begins this way. It says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? So Jesus is addressing the believers in Thyatira. So far in our series, we've seen that this courier has brought these letters from where Jesus dictated them to John here on the Isle of Patmos to Ephesus here, 35 miles up the coast to Smyrna here, then 60 miles to the ancient city of Pergamum here, and now Today, we see 35 miles down the road to the Macedonian colony of Thyatira, which is here. Whenever you study ancient Thyatira, this this city, almost all the commentators say the same thing. They tell you that Thyatira was not very impressive of a city. It had no palaces, no universities, no temples to Caesar, no, no, no uh, uh, giant structures dedicated to the gods of Rome or Greece. But Thyatira was famous for one thing. It was a working class city, which meant it had a lot of trade guilds. Wool workers, linen workers, dye workers, leather workers, bronze smiths, potters. And if you wanted to work in any of these trades in Thyatira, you had to join one of the guilds, which made it tough on the believers there. Because in all of these these guilds, their gatherings, their conventions, they included idol worship. 
More than that, these gatherings, everyone was expected to participate in excessive drinking and sexual immorality. It was just part of what was expected. It was part of the culture. It was part of the deal. As I've already mentioned in today's message, I will be contrasting Jesus with Jezebel. Jesus represents our life with God, our spiritual life and following of Him, while Jezebel represents the way of the world. So the first category I want to consider is this, life without God. This is where the people of Thyatira were before the church was planted there. Life simply revolved around work, idolatry, and sex. In other words, you could describe it this way, no Jesus, only Jezebel. No Jesus, only Jezebel. No life with God, no, no spiritual vitality, simply adrift in the patterns of the culture all around it. And this is pretty much everyone's story before they meet Christ. We don't know any different. The way of the world is simply the way, period. Unless you were very young when you invited Jesus into your life, you can probably remember a time when this was you. It's not that it was all bad or entirely reckless. It's just that Jesus was not a part of the picture. And so you're just going along with the flow of the world around you. The culture simply caught you up in, 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 in the flow and you didn't know any different. Sometimes Christians can get all bent out of shape about the messed up culture all around us. I never expect the world to live by God's principles. The world has its own playbook. Paul says that for all of us, before Jesus came into our life, we were all without hope and without God in the world. Life without God can be summarized like this then. No Jesus, only Jezebel. But then Jesus enters the picture. And, and, and we're not sure, but we have a guess of how the gospel came to Thyatira. This past summer, if you were around, you, you may remember that in our long, series short, our long story short series, we met a woman named Lydia. Lydia had become a Christian uh, through her encounter with the Apostle Paul on the banks of a river. And, and, and Lydia was from, you guessed it, Thyatira. And so it's very possible that Lydia brought the message of Jesus back to her hometown and was the reason that a church was planted there. No matter what, however it happened, an upstart church of brand new believers was planted in this no Jesus, only Jezebel town. And so Jesus dictated a letter to his believers there. To his believers, his people, his sons and daughters, and the church in that environment. Middle of verse 18. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Jesus honors this small upstart church by sending a letter directly to them. And he describes himself in such a striking way. First, as having eyes like blazing fire. In other words, penetrating insight into their lives. Searching their minds, their attitudes, their hearts. And his feet, well, his feet were like burnished bronze. Now, this is a term that the metal workers in Thyatira could understand. His feet were solid. They were massive. They were firmly planted. In other words, this letter was from the Son of God who is standing above all else, who suppresses the world and its ways under His feet. So what would this powerful Jesus say to them? It's actually quite affirming. Verse 19, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. I know that sometimes people rank the church of Thyatira as one of the bad churches 
in Revelation. But they got the most glowing report from Jesus of all the churches. I mean, every subject on their report card is an A. Think about it. If you believe like James that genuine faith shows up in actions, they had it. Jesus says, I know your deeds. If you say like Paul that the greatest of all is love, they had that too, love. If you say like the book of Romans that what really matters is faith, they had that too. If you say, yes, but, but God looks at your motives, they had that, a servant's heart. And if you say that, that it needs to be more than just a spurt of activity, but, but it has to go on over and over over time, they had that too, perseverance. And if you say that it's important to keep growing, to not just get static and comfortable, they had that too, doing more than they did at first. When, when Jesus comes into our lives, it is all embracing. It starts to impact every area of our lives, our faith, our love, our actions, our attitudes, our consistency. And it grows more and more, becoming increasingly fruitful. So, so this is important. Here's how I would describe it. Coming to faith is more Jesus, less Jezebel. When you become a Christian, you don't instantly lose the world's influence. It's not this automatic break from all that was before. Rather, like these ancient believers, Jesus comes in, starts to impact every area, our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, and then with time, it grows and grows. More Jesus, less Jezebel. So perhaps this will help. I'd like to ask you to do, a fa do me a favor and, and play along with me here. Would you just uh, overlap your arms, um, just overlap them right over left like this, uh, your fingers not all the way to your elbows, a little bit of a gap between your elbows and your fingers. Uh, this should be a mirror image of you like this. Uh, that's Cindy, who is my model for this photograph, so there you go. Uh, this elbow right here represents when you... Uh, uh, when you were born, right here. Oh, and this finger right here represents when you became a Christian. This finger right here is when you die, and this elbow is all eternity with Jesus. Now consider this. The bottom arm is the Jezebel life, the way of the world. It was 100% before you came to Christ. The top arm is your new life in Christ. Faith, love, actions, attitudes, perseverance. And finally, notice this. As life goes on, God's plan is that the Jezebel life gets less and less, and the Jesus life becomes more and more. His life becomes your life. That's how it was for the believers in Thyatira. They were growing in their faith. The Jezebel life was getting less and less. The Jesus life more and more. Doing more than they did at first. This is God's plan for you as well. That as you grow in your journey with the Lord, more Jesus, less Jezebel. So, so this was a great church. An exemplary church. But they had one glaring problem, one major blind spot. Verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So now you see, you see why I'm calling the way of the world Jezebel. It was very pertinent to this letter. Apparently, there was a woman within the church who was claiming to be sent from God. 
and she was teaching that it was okay to adopt all the destructive practices of the culture around them, all the sexual immorality and idolatry that was there. Now, Jezebel was not her real name. Instead, it was a symbolic name, uh, a reminder of the infamous queen in the Old Testament whose name had become synonymous with evil. Jezebel in the Old Testament was, was this persuasive and compelling individual. She intimidated God's people, uh, including Elijah. She deceived God's people into sin. She shattered faith, destroyed families. And spoiler alert, she paid dearly for the destruction that she brought with her own life. And her lineage was cut off. In the same way, apparently there was in this town a woman prophet who, like Jezebel, was persuasive and compelling, intimidating, enticing the people of God into immorality and idol worship and destroying lives. And where it gets especially dicey, we will learn about later in this letter, she promised these believers, part of her message was this, that if they listened to her, if they followed her teaching, they could know Satan's deep secrets. What? Why Satan's deep secrets? And why would any believer fall for that? Well, history records that, that later on there was this heresy in the early church that taught that, that in order for believers to defeat Satan, you had to enter his stronghold and experience evil firsthand. This could be a precursor to that teaching. Jezebel was saying, don't worry about all the idolatry and sexual misconduct in your businesses. As a matter of fact, dive right in. Then you will know the deep secrets of Satan and therefore grow closer to God. Here's a tip. If you go to a group meeting and they say they're going to teach you Satan's deep secrets, get out of there. <laughs> Nevertheless, less, this is what this woman was teaching. As I said earlier, the world has its own playbook. It follows its own script. But the church has a different playbook. And what is dangerous is when a leader enters in who suggests that combining the two is just fine. Sin is okay. Compromise is kosher. Which leads to the next point. For most believers, after they come to faith, it is an inevitable temptation both Jesus and Jezebel. You can have them both. To juggle both of them in your life. Somehow keep them going. At the same time, I've got Jesus, I've got the world, and I've somehow got to keep them both together. And it gets harder and harder. Nevertheless, it's an inevitable temptation for many believers to live our lives with one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the culture to juggle Jesus and Jezebel. So Jesus continues in verse 21. He says, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Jesus mercifully has been patient, even with this destructive leader, incredibly merciful, it seems, giving her time to repent, but she would not. Which leads to the inevitable result. It always is true. Jezebel rejects Jesus' rescue. Incredibly, Jesus would have rescued this woman and everyone that she'd influenced if they would simply let him. But tragically, they would not. Instead, they experienced the repercussions of their destruction and the consequences of sin are always severe. Verse 22, So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. 
unless they repent of her ways. If you read this verse carefully, it shows that even then there was time to repent. But there comes a time when the consequences of sin will catch up. And it gets even more sobering in verse 23. I will strike her children dead. Pause there. What does that mean? Again, this is a reference to the Old Testament, to the Old Testament story that this analogy is built upon. In the Old Testament, Jezebel's two sons and daughters were slain, and she was left without a lineage, without an impact, without a legacy, without a future. So this basically means that, that Jesus would ensure that this teaching in the church would have no future. He is saying that this evil influence will end with her. But then notice how verse 23 ends. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Again, these letters were not just for the individual churches, but for all the churches. They were being circulated to every single one. And Jesus was right. I mean, here we are some 2,000 years later in our church, still talking about it. Then all the churches will know that I am him who searches hearts and minds. Sin is its own punishment. And the consequences can be severe. And when we try to have both Jesus and Jezebel in our lives, it can be tragic. Because Jezebel, that is this world, will always reject Jesus' rescue. So what is the safeguard? How can we avoid this kind of dual life, the tension of trying to juggle Jesus and Jezebel? Well, fortunately, Jesus tells us in verses 24 and 25. He continues, he says, Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to those who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. Notice these verses mention the word hold two different times. Verse 24, do not hold to her teaching. Verse 25, do hold on to what you have until I come. So the safeguard is to release Jezebel and hold on to Jesus. Release Jezebel, hold on to Jesus. Jesus asked his beloved sons and daughters to do just one thing. Hold on to what you have until I come. And what they have is Jesus. What they have is faith, love, actions, perseverance, growth. What they have is all-knowing, all-seeing, rock-solid Savior who is coming back for them. So the safeguard, release Jezebel, hold on to Jesus. As with every letter, Jesus ends his letter with a promise. Verse 26 to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Again, images that the, the metal workers and the, the potters and Thyatira would, would appreciate. That one will rule over them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. So what is this authority that Jesus promises to his people to have over the nations? Well, Jesus explains it in verse 26. He promises this in verse 26. To the one who is victorious, I will give authority over the nations. And then the end of verse 27, he explains, just as I have received authority from my father. 
it seems that this reference is to our victory in this world over the influences of our culture. Even as Jesus was given authority over all things, so we share in that authority even now as we live in upright, righteous lives among the nations that is in this world. And then Jesus adds in verse 28, I will also give that one the morning star. What a great picture. A morning star. The, 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 the morning star appears before sunrise, indicating that the darkness is almost over. And later in the book of Revelation, Jesus refers to himself as the morning star. It's a title that he gives to himself. Therefore, the morning star here is a picture of Jesus himself who will carry us through the dark culture and bring us into a bright future. Verse 29, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The phrase that Jesus repeats in every letter. So as we've been doing, I want to finish each message with a simple principle. Here goes. You need to hear this. Based on what we have just heard from the risen Jesus, addressed to a church that he loved, and especially with the promise that he ends this letter with, a promise for victory in this life and hope for the future, in light of that, you need to hear. Hold on to Jesus. And you can have victory now and hope for the future. Instead of trying to juggle Jesus and Jezebel, the kingdom and our culture, God and the world, hold on to Jesus, only Him. And you will experience victory in this life and great hope for the future. And I bet I'm not the only one that needed to hear that. Father God, Thank you so much for loving us so much to speaking to us and speaking to our lives and speaking to our world and addressing the very real tensions that we feel in this culture. And we admit that pressure that we so often feel to, to, to try to juggle both this world and, and our faith in you. And we pray, Lord, that you would, you would instruct us from your word and empower us by your spirit to focus on you. We know there's great promise in that. And uh, help us to live for that promise today and always. Thank you today for the opportunity to participate in, in giving, and we ask your blessing on it. In Jesus' name, amen.